Why don't you, in your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be finishing our, our session in Acts chapter 1 today. Um, who here struggles to make decisions? Yeah, there's a couple of hands here and there. Some of us might be perfectionists. We, we fear making decisions because of the risks that they might take. Um, some of us might just struggle to work out what we're going to wear in the morning. And that was a struggle in our household this morning. Uh, the kids trying to work out, what, what, what should I wear? Mike is wanting to wear the same clothes he's been work, wearing all week. And I was like, no, we need to wash them. Uh, maybe for some of us, we're thinking, okay, do we move house? Or, or, or where should we move house? Or, or maybe it's, who should we marry? Or who should we not marry? Uh, maybe it's what kids, uh, what school the kids should be going to, what, what university they should be going to, or, or, or what job they should be going to. Maybe it's for us what job we should be having. Each day, ultimately, we have to make decisions, uh, big and small. On, on Friday, I made the decision to give blood, and I'm regretting it now because I fainted. Um, I fainted afterwards. Um, so this morning, um, if I faint, it is because of that, okay? Um, just take me to the side, drag me over, give me some biscuits, and that will, that will get me back in order. Uh, but I just wanted to prepare you for that and to embarrass me even more after last week. Um, Whatever happens, as we make decisions as Christians, uh, we are to do it, as we've been singing, with the, the glory of God in mind. We're to make our decisions with the glory of God in mind. That is to be our primary motivator. And so as we seek to learn how to do that, uh, ultimately we're going to look at this passage in Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 12 uh, to 26. Uh, and that's going to be the focus of the sermon. But if, if we were to put it in a nutshell from something in the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. And essentially, that is what we're going to be looking at today. That is essentially how we can make decisions in line with the will of God by, by knowing God, uh, by leaning on informed wisdom from God, by trusting God, and making a decision in light of his glory. That's essentially the sermon distilled. If you forget everything else that I might say today, remember those things. Uh, but let's unpack it from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. So do turn there now. It will be on the screen behind me as well. They then returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers." In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And Peter said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle with all his bowels gushing out. And it became known to all, and all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that that field was called, in their own language, al Kadama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, uh, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barshabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these, uh, these two you have chosen to take a place in this ministry and apostle, apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for him. Or they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. These apostles, they've returned to Jerusalem after seeing Jesus ascend to his heavenly throne. 
They acted in obedience to him. He was, Jesus said, go and stay and remain in Jerusalem, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promised uh, Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. And so they, they gather in the upper room. Now, this could be the upper room where they enjoy the Passover meal together, that final, that last supper, when Jesus afterwards was betrayed in the garden. Or it could be any other upper room. There's a number of possible scenarios, but the, 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 the place doesn't necessarily matter. It's what happened in that place and who was there uh, is what we should be paying attention to. Look as he, as he narrates who was there. He names the 11 apostles, the remaining apostles. And interestingly, he names them in a slightly different way to that as he names them in his own gospel narrative. Uh, we, we begin to see the blood brother relationships of, of, of Peter and Andrew and, and James and John. They're broken apart. And instead, what we find now is a new order. Peter and John and James and Andrew. And, and they became the, the leading apostles of the church. And we're going to follow these four of the 11 primarily as we walk through Acts. You're going to see their names time and time again. But what Luke is trying to signify in this, in this reordering of the account is that there's a new brotherhood, a new brotherhood in Christ within this new community that isn't, isn't based on, on blood, but is based on how Christ has, is using these apostles for his glory. And then in that room were the women, uh, and that's likely going to be uh, those who follow Jesus, those who supported Jesus in his ministry, likely Mary Magdalene, Joanna, whose husband managed Herod's household, Susanna, Mary, the mother of James, uh, and then others who, who find that empty tomb. They, along with the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And I love that little bit at the end. And if you caught uh, this morning's little prayer update for the youth, uh, I would have shared something on that. Uh, the fact that in the Gospels, according to John, uh, not even his brothers believed in him. Not even Jesus' brothers believed in him. And I find that it's incredible because they lived with Jesus for 30 years. Uh, they, they no doubt heard some of the rumors that were going on about how Jesus came to be. But yet they didn't really know him. Throughout the Gospels, we don't see any mention of any of his brothers becoming a disciple or a follower of Jesus before his crucifixion. But it is after his crucifixion, it's after his resurrection that we begin to see them uh, in the upper room. It's after his ascension that we see them in the upper room worshipping their brother as God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, that, that Jesus appeared to James and the brother of Jesus after his resurrection. He, he is named in that list in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, because Jesus has revealed himself and it utterly transformed James's life. Utterly transformed it from, from unbelief that his brother was, was anything special uh, to belief that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah of the world. Eyes opened to the reality of his half-brother as God incarnate. It was from that moment of, of seeing his brother resurrected and that James becomes one of the, the prominent figures, one of the prominent leaders in the Jerusalem church. I, I say that as such a, a beautiful thing because we've got some young people who are, who are focusing on the resurrection this weekend and some of them are going, is there enough evidence? Some of them are asking the same questions that, that, that James had and the other brothers of Jesus. Is, is there any evidence that my brother is anything other than just a human who he goes out and teaches? The evidence for James was seeing his brother resurrected, seeing what God is doing incarnate, seeing his brother being the one that saves the world of their sins. So take heart. Many of us are praying for our friends, praying for unbelieving family members to, to, to respond to the good news of the gospel, yet they seem to keep on resisting. Their hearts seem to keep on being hardened to the gospel. Don't let their resistance be the final word. Don't let their resistance be the final word. They, they may yet believe and they may yet be used significantly for the kingdom of God, just like James was. James died for the sake of his brother's ministry. He died for the sake of his brother's mission because he truly understood who his brother was. Jesus was the savior of the world, God incarnate. 
the one who has ascended into the heavenly throne rooms and is now ruling and reigning over all. Now in those days, in the ten days between Jesus ascending and then the promised Holy Spirit coming in Pentecost, uh, what we see is these 120 believers coming together in that upper room, praying together, being devoted to prayer. Now that 120, it's a random little figure that, that Luke has highlighted for us, and there's a reason for that. 120 is a critical mass in Jewish tradition. Essentially, it's a, it's a mass that allows a new community to be formed under a, under a council that can lead and direct them. And so isn't it amazing to think that these 120 passionate, God-glorifying believers, praising God, praying fervently in that upper room, it leads to the multiplication of believers across the nations. We sit here today because of those original 120 that sat in that upper room praying to God, trusting in God, knowing that God had promised that, that his name would be made famous amongst the nations. And they pray into that we see these 120 empowered by the Holy Spirit and then becoming 3,000 uh, as the, the word of God goes out. We see these 120 meeting in homes across the city, praising God and praying fervently, being devoted to the teaching of the apostles, seeing more and more being added to their number day after day as they lived out their ordinary lives with each other in obedience and in worship to Christ. Before Pentecost, these, these men and women in faith had, had such a sense of togetherness, such a sense of unity. They were of one accord. They were eagerly waiting what the Lord Jesus had promised, what the Father had promised. They were eagerly awaiting the, the Holy Spirit to come upon them. They were eagerly waiting to, to step into all that the Lord had called them to do. I don't know what it was like in GC this week for you, but as we walked through uh, some of the, the passages of Scripture to understand the, the reality and the implication of the ascension for us, knowing that Jesus would return, it gave us in our GC a, a greater desire, a greater urgency uh, to go out and to make him known. The apostles, as they, as they have witnessed the ascension of Jesus, as they've heard his command to them, the apostles and all those with them, the 120, are united in one mind. They are together in their focus for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they are devoting themselves in prayer. Luke has told us from the end of his gospel narrative uh, that they were constantly, every day, going to the temple to praise God. And then they were coming to their homes, as we see in this passage, each and every day, constantly praying. They weren't leaning on their own strengths. They were leaning wholeheartedly on God. They had a singular focus, a united togetherness, focused on the commands and the promises of Jesus, and it caused them to pray and to praise. God's promises don't make prayer unnecessary. We know what God has promised. Therefore, we lean into it by praying wholeheartedly. God's sovereignty doesn't, doesn't make prayer unnecessary. It, it actually fuels our prayers. It gives us a confidence that, that God will hear, that God will answer those prayers in accordance with his will. But how are we to discern the will of God? How are we to make godly decisions in our lives and, and for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church? Well, as we dig further into this passage, we're going to understand how the early church had to work that out, how they sought to discern the will of God, particularly in how they sought to replace Judas. And to begin with, we need to have this mindset. We need to have this in, in one accord. The, if the reason that we're still on this planet is to advance the mission and the ministry of Christ, the ministry of redeeming people to him, then it just makes sense that every decision that we make Every decision that we must face, we have to approach it with the same view, with the same purpose in mind. And so what we find here is Peter, he takes the lead before the brothers. He takes the lead before these Christians, those who know and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he speaks scripture to them. He explains it first, and he explains why, he explains how. In verse 16, he says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. 
for he, is, he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. And then he, exp- he says the verses in verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. We have to know and understand the scriptures. Peter, having had his mind opened by the Lord Jesus, that he would understand the scriptures, having been taught the scriptures by Jesus himself, he began to see and understand how all of the scriptures point ultimately to the sufferings and to the joys, to the glory, to the rejection, and to the reign of the Messiah. He is seeing how all of scripture All the scripture that he would have known of, the Old Testament as we know it, ultimately points to Jesus, to the Messiah. And Peter is able to recognize that the scriptures are are trustworthy, that they are the supreme authority as, as God's revealed will. And he's able to see and understand that it is the Holy Spirit that inspires all of scripture. And so he tells these 120 believers essentially what Paul reminds Timothy in his letter. From childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, with the the Old Testament, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He's saying the scripture had to be fulfilled. It's the same kind of language. All scripture is breathed out by God. The Holy Spirit has spoken it. He has inspired it by human authors and mouths. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be competent, equipped for every good work. The disciples, even in this moment, even in the upper room, even as they've been gathering together, they're likely still shocked. They're likely still confused by what happened with Judas. In many ways, they, they don't fully comprehend it, and it's, they don't see that it was in the unfolding plan of God. And so Peter opens Scripture for them. And he, he speaks to them from Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. These two Psalms have in view the the wicked and the treacherous men who are enemies of God's king. For David, who who wrote these, it it, it was an immediate sense because there was men who were chasing after him, trying to kill him as God's king. For Peter, David spoke a prophetic word. David spoke words of judgment upon the men who were before him. But ultimately, Peter is able to see that these were prophetic judgments and could apply them to Judas. God's word, responsibly applied, provided the proper interpretation and the proper perspective on the shocking and confusing events of of Judas. Friends, whenever we're struggling to to comprehend the plan and the sovereignty of God in our world and in our lives, when we're um, seeking to to really understand and wrestle with what's, what's happening around us, we are to look first to scriptures to make sense of what's going on in us, around us, in our world. We are to continually rediscover perspective and and truth and instruction and the beauty of our Savior as we look to the Scriptures, as we grow to to know and, and understand and interpret the Bible. Peter understood that the Judas betrayal of Jesus was part of God's plan, and he knew that something needed to be done in light of Judas' demise. Now, on that point, I think it's useful for us to to just provide some clarity. And Luke does this himself. He he puts a little footnote to the reader, a little um, little explanation of what's been going on in those parentheses in verses 18 and 19. Let's have a quick look at that. Uh, Now this man, he says, he's talking about Judas, he acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness uh, with the 30 pieces of silver that he was given by the chief priests uh, for the betrayal of Jesus. Uh, And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out. And I'm sorry for the visual representation of that, but that's what's going on. The Bible is pretty open about that. And it became known to all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem that this field was to be called in their own language, Al-Kaldama, that is, field of blood. Now, if you know the Gospels, you might know of another account in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 27, which which details that, that, that Judas brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests. He threw it away, and then he went and he hung himself. Matthew details then that the chief priests took the silver and bought the potter's field, that is a burial place for strangers. And they did this because the money was blood money. 
It wasn't money that they could put back into their own pockets or into the treasury. It was blood money. It was Judas's money. And the field that they bought is the field of blood. So there's loads of clear connections between these two accounts. But on first hearing, you might be thinking that there's a few contradictions. And so I want you to remember Luke's primary profession. Luke was a doctor. Who here likes silent witness? Just me. (laughs) Come on, there we go, there we go. Thank you. Sometimes it takes one to say yes before everyone else jumps in. Silent witness, all about forensic pathology. Um, And if you think in your mind about Luke, he is writing an account based on his experience. Luke is giving a blow-by-blow detail of what happened to Judas. If a man hung himself in a field near Jerusalem, in the, in the height of the heat that would have been experienced there, he would have died by hanging, uh, but his body would be decomposing in the heat. If you're squeamish, um, I'm sorry, uh, but his internal organs would have been decomposing, gases would have been building up, he would have bloated, his muscle tissue would be getting thinner and weaker. At some point, either by someone trying to get him off Um, or by the branch breaking or the rope breaking, he would have fallen headlong. He would have fallen to the ground. And at that point, his his muscles, his skin bursts open, and his bowels gush out. It's gross. (laughs) It's really gross, but it's real. That's what happened. The Bible never shies away from that kind of stuff. We were reminiscing in GC of all of the Old Testament versions of of events, particularly in Judges. If you want something to scare your kids, there's a good place to go. Um, But it shows us the cohesiveness of, of two authors from different perspectives and the inspired nature of Scripture. The field of blood was was bought either way through the reward money that Jesus that Judas had been given whether it was purchased before or after. It was ultimately acquired by Judas, by his blood money. No life would dwell in that place, as Peter said and used scripture to speak of, for it became a desolate burial ground. There was no life there. It was a burial place for strangers who had died in Jerusalem. So given that the office of apostle was vacant because Judas um, had, had died and was in his wickedness and apostasy and his betrayal. Peter took Psalm 109, verse 8, to mean that it needed to be given to another. It needed to be given to someone else. Now, how did he get there? How did he get to that conclusion? And here's a lifetime application for us all. Do what the Bible says. Do what the Bible says. Do what Jesus says. Jesus himself had previously appointed the 12 apostles. He did this based on the 12 tribes of Israel. The number 12 had to be restored. There couldn't be 11 of them. There needed to be 12 of them because the true Israel needed to be complete. And the Lord Jesus made it clear that uh, through his words that there were to be 12 apostles so that uh, ultimately the, the remaining 11 had to take action and they had to make choices Uh, with that in mind. And there's an immediate reason for this, and there's an eternal reason for this. In the immediate, the role of the apostle was crucial because it was for the advancement of the gospel that the Lord Jesus had left them to the ends of the earth. They were eyewitnesses. They were those who had observed Jesus' life. All the way from his baptism through to his ascension. That is why Peter gives that qualification from from the baptism of Jesus to the ascension of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses who had observed and could confirm Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. They were first-hand learners from Jesus. They were disciples. They were followers of Jesus who could therefore accurately pass on firsthand his words. For it was the words of Jesus that would become the solid foundation on which the church would be built. It would would be that that informs the apostles' teaching. And this vacant role, it's it's unique. Uh, The apostle kind of office isn't something that keeps on going as apostles die. There was no succession planning required after this point. There was no transfer of the role between the remaining apostles after they had died. There's no example in James, uh, for for James whenever he died in Acts 12, of, of anyone having to replace him because Judas was replaced not because of his death, but because of his apostasy, because he abandoned and betrayed Jesus. 
while the other apostles were made faithful unto death. In discerning the will of God, in making decisions about what to do next, the apostles were rightly concerned with the immediate spread of the gospel. And we should have similar concerns and desires as a church. How will our decisions enhance or how will our decisions hinder the spread of the gospel? That's the question that we must continue to ask ourselves. But there's also the broader kingdom sense, the the broader kingdom purpose, the eternal purpose for replacing Judas. Jesus told the 12 apostles in Matthew 19 that they would have a unique role within the kingdom. He says this, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, uh, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. By by filling Judas' office, the church is acknowledging, the apostles are acknowledging and valuing the the special role of apostle. And Peter leads the, the, the believers to know God's revealed will through Scripture so that they will know what to do. So that they will know what to do. Friends, we don't need to wonder at all about whether we should be making disciples or whether we should be praying or whether we should be living holy lives or whether we should be seeking to to gather together as God's people, whether we should be faithful in our marriages, whether we should be caring for widows and orphans. We don't need to wonder about those kind of things because they're clear in Scripture. They're clear in the Bible. That is God's clearly revealed will. It's always the right course of action whenever God has willed it and revealed it to us. These early Christians, they they knew that they needed to replace Judas. It was was clear to them through Scripture. It was clear to them through Jesus' own words and his own teaching. But what they didn't know was the name of the person. They didn't know the name of the guy that was to replace Judas. That was God's concealed will. That was God's hidden will. And that was to be revealed to them through prayer and through wise action. Many Christians can spend countless hours, can't they? Days, weeks, even months trying to understand the concealed will of God, the hidden will of God. And often they do it without spending any time looking into God's revealed will through the Bible. The believers in this passage, they demonstrate a confidence. They demonstrate an allegiance to the scriptures that ultimately make even finding the concealed will of God relatively easy. Eleven years ago, Joe and I were up in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. We had just graduated uh, from university there. We were married. We were starting our married life together. And we were on the cusp of making some big decisions in our lives. Uh, The church that we were going to, uh, we're going through a a leadership change. uh, And I was being invited uh, 11 years ago to consider stepping into eldership. I'd already been preaching there. Uh, We loved the church there. We loved the people there. I knew that I had a desire to be an elder, like Paul talks about to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3. Uh, But I also felt ill-equipped. I also felt too young, too inexperienced um, for that. And I also had another job offer. I had a job offer in Stoke-on-Trent. I'd never heard of Stoke-on-Trent. I had never been to Stoke-on-Trent. But it was to work with university students, to equip them and encourage them in their mission to make Jesus known on their campus. So we had two opportunities before us. Those both opportunities were godly opportunities. Both were good opportunities. Both were for the glory of God. And I distinctly remember we, we went to a beach and we kind of sat there and we were praying together and we were praying things like, Lord, would you write in the sand before us that we would know where to go, whether it's to stay here or go there? Would you, would you open doors? And who's heard of this language? Open a door for us and close another um, such, such random language at times that we use. But that's, that was us trying to understand God's concealed will for us at that time. But what made the decision easy for us is what I can only call a prophetic word. We, we were at church one morning, and the passage was focused on Jesus' baptism, and then uh, Jesus being taken into the wilderness in preparation for his public ministry. And, and after the service, someone uh, came to us, and they prayed with us, and they shared that they felt the Lord was showing us that going to Stoke-on-Trent, it might feel like a wilderness for us. I'm sorry if anyone's from Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> but for us, it felt like a wilderness. Uh, the stories that we had heard 
they, they, it didn't appeal to us. The location didn't appeal to us. But yet, God spoke in those moments into our hearts, and we trusted him in prayer, and we made the decision to move. We ended up in Stoke-on-Trent. Fast forward five years, we were now on the cusp of another decision. It was to leave Stoke-on-Trent, and we were planning to move to Salford Keys. We were planning to go and plant a new church in Salford Keys. Again, a godly decision, again seeking to bring glory to God in a place where there was no gospel presence at all. We were excited. We were all guns blazing. We were ready to go. But as we neared the time through the wise counsel of others, and we began to, to realize that our gifting, our abilities, our passions maybe didn't lie in that location, in that place with the, with the people of Sulphur Keys, but actually somewhere else. That, that the gifting, the, the passion, the abilities maybe didn't lend itself to being a, a lead planter of a church in a new place among urban professionals um, young media people, but actually maybe to, to come somewhere else and to help equip the church in mission and in the sending out of teams to go and plant churches to the ends of the earth. And at the time, realizing that our plans weren't going to go ahead as we had thought, uh, we were disorientated. We were shocked. We were saddened. We, we wept unconsolably. We weren't necessarily understanding the sovereignty of God. And then Joe's mum uh, spoke to us from Scripture. And she reminded us of a story of Abraham and Isaac going up the hill towards a place where Isaac would be sacrificed. Isaac uh, was Abraham's only son. Uh, and God had promised that Abraham, and even in his old age, would have a son. But Abraham trusted the Lord. He carried everything with him to sacrifice that son, he trusted the Lord and his promises. And at the very last moment, God provided an alternative sacrifice. And what a comfort that passage was for us. We were prepared to leave Stoke on Trent. Our church had blessed us and, and was supporting us in, in, in going and, and going to a new place. And we ended up discovering that the alternative that God was providing to us was to join a church in the Wirral called Cornerstone, where we find ourselves today. God has been good, and I share that ultimately to, to show how the concealed part of God's will, of God's plan, can be relatively simple to understand, can be relatively simple to discover when you have confidence and allegiance to what, has, what he has revealed in his word. And other people are able to speak his word into those moments. And when you pray in light of those truths and you make decisions in light of his glory. The believers in Acts, they knew that God had chosen a man for the office of apostle. And they had to work out through the process of seeking God's will, simply who that was. And from what Peter learned from Jesus, he's able to lay down those qualifications. A man who has been with us during the time, from the baptism of Jesus all the way through to his ascension, that he might be someone who knows who Jesus is, that he might be someone who knows the teachings of Jesus and be able to pass them on correctly, faithfully. But also a man who has witnessed the resurrected Jesus so that he can testify to that. He can be a witness of that. And so as they look at the 120 believers in the room, two men fit the bill. It's like a massive game of guess who. Um, what a, I, I just can't imagine what was going on in, in that room. Like, who, who fits the bill? Who fits the bill? And with all the information that they had, through God's revealed will, through the wise application of Peter, they were able to bring forward two men, Joseph and Matthias. In verse 24, and they prayed. And they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and this apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. We are to trust in the sovereignty of the Lord. And we do that through prayer. They prayed to the Lord regarding his choice. They knew it was the Lord who was doing the choosing. Apostleship isn't something that humans put into office. Only the Lord could choose. The Lord is the knower of hearts. He doesn't see things the way that we see them. 
1 Samuel 16, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord sees the heart of man. And so in our decision making, we are to take it all to the Lord. We're not to ask for a picture in the sky or, or writing in the sand or physical doors to open and close. We are to pray to the Lord for wisdom and discernment, that we would know his, his will, that we would know his ways. God has given us minds and the power of reason within our minds, but the Lord's ways are inscrutable. We need to know that. We, we won't always understand them. We won't always uh, know them. But what we can know is that they are always for his glory and for our good, for the good of those who love him. And so having turned to the Lord throughout this whole process, having trusted in his word and the scriptures, having leaned into understanding to interpret his word, having used the wisdom of the Lord and being able to bring glory to God to advance his mission, they were able to narrow down the decision to two options. And in prayer, they wholeheartedly trusted that the Lord would make his decision. And so they cast lots. They make the decision and they go for it. He is named as one of the apostles. Now, casting lots feels like a, a strange thing, uh, almost like a game of chance. It's much like flipping a coin. Will I do this or will I do that? I'll flip a coin for it. It's like rolling dice. It's a game of chance. But throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament to this point, it was still commonplace. It was still a legitimate means of making decisions and trusting God's sovereignty. In Proverbs 16, uh, verse 33, God says this, the, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Even in the, the chance moments, the Lord is orchestrating the decisions. And so it really was a legitimate means of trusting God's sovereignty. But this is the last scriptural case of casting lots to make a decision. So we here at Cornerstone, we're not going to be casting lots for new GC leaders. We're not going to be casting lots to make a decision as to who's going to be leading worship next week. We're not going to be casting lots as to who's going to be doing the to cleaning of the toilets or putting away the chairs. We won't be casting lots for that. With the Holy Spirit indwelling his people, it is he that helps us to make wise, godly decisions. But the overall process doesn't change. We are still to make decisions. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and prayer are all sufficient for discerning the will of God today. Not flipping coins, not casting lots, not rolling a dice. When we as Christians understand our role in the unfolding drama of redemption, when we, when we grasp onto God's revealed will by growing in our knowledge of his word in the Bible, as we gather together the necessary information in order to narrow down the choices that are before us, when we have prayed to the Lord in trust and dependence upon his sovereign hand, we should simply trust God and make a decision and go for it. Sometimes we don't do that because we fear that we'll make the wrong decision. The Father knows if we truly desire to please him. When we make decisions with his glory in mind, with his glory in our hearts, he knows that. And if things don't work out, as perhaps we would have thought, that doesn't change his love for us. That doesn't change his love for us. Sometimes we think that if, if things don't work out, it means that we were against God's plan or he was against our plans. That's not necessarily true. We think that God is unhappy with us because we made the wrong decision, that his love falters for us. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for I'm sure that neither life nor death, nor angels nor rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, there's nothing that will separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. So we are to make decisions and rest in those truths, in that good news. Even when faced with what might feel like a stressful decision, when we, when we make decisions with the glory of God in mind, 
informed by the word of God, discerning the spirit of God. When we trust in the sovereignty of God, we can step into those decisions with peace and with confidence that God continues to work sovereignly. He continues to work sovereignly out his plans to advance his kingdom, to advance his mission. And he continues to do that sovereignly through the church. And so as we continue to walk in faith and obedience to all God is leading us into, so that his glory might be made great in our lives, we seek to do that all the way to the ends of the earth, wherever it might lead us, and we trust in him through it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are sovereign Lord. We thank you that you created all things. All things are yours. Your glory is, is, is worthy. And so Lord, we pray that as we, as we seek to live out our lives, making decisions, I pray that we will have hearts that are seeking to glorify you. We will have minds that are, are seeking to, to glorify your name, to make your name great, not our own. And Lord God, I pray that we will be people that trust in your word, that trust in what you have revealed to us through scripture, that, that know your word to such a degree that, that are growing in confidence in your word, that are growing in our knowledge of your word, that we might know you and your ways, that we would be people that trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, that we wouldn't lean in, into our own understanding, but that we will seek to honor and obey you, follow you, and Lord God, as we seek to maybe make decisions of things that, that we don't have a manual for, that we don't have the direct answers for in your revealed will, Lord, I pray that we would trust in your spirit, helping us to discern, helping us to know what is right. That we would responsibly apply and interpret scripture so that we can walk with confidence, making decisions in confidence, and that you will use them for your glory. And so, Lord God, I thank you that you've been teaching us today. I thank you that you've been helping us to understand your will for our lives today. Helping us, I pray, to make decisions with your glory in mind today. And so, Lord, would you continue to minister to us? Would you continue to reveal your will to us through Scripture as we read it, as we talk about it, as we speak of it to one another each and every day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.